joining us. I hope everyone is doing well this evening. Today we have Ricky Kitchen, an interventional specialist who will be talking to us about managing your school years. Welcome Ricky and thank you for being with us here today. Thank you, Adam. I really appreciate that. And um, welcome to you all, uh, whether you're watching live or whether you're uh, watching, you know, at another time period. Uh, my name is Ricky Kitchen. Uh, I'm an intervention specialist at a high school in Ohio. Um, been doing this for some time. I also have a background in medical social work. Uh, I've done some work with um, different organizations in the past. Uh, I've had the privilege of speaking uh, for the Continuous Employment Foundation at some of their uh, two-day seminars in the past and uh, love working with uh, Susan who's just an absolute joy to work with. Uh, I first was introduced to the uh, Continuous Lymphoma Foundation through Judy Jones years ago and just love Judy. Uh, I've been, had the privilege of working with some of the other representatives and uh, again uh, it, this is just a, a, an awesome resource for all of us, uh, a patient myself uh, in the past as well. Uh, we'll continue, well currently as well. And uh, today we wanna to go ahead and talk about uh, managing your school years. Now this is going to be uh, going towards individuals that are actually school age, um, junior high, high school age students, as well as their parents and guardians, predominantly parents and guardians. But again, I would like also uh, if, you know, it would be good for them to watch this as well. And maybe there's some good information that they would be able to maybe have questions. Um, there will be a Q&A at the end of this uh, time period. Once we're finished here today, uh, you'll answer, you'll send your questions through Autumn. And then uh, you can also type that uh, information uh, in the chat box and then Autumn will take a look at that as well. And also if you're viewing this from YouTube at a later date, if you have questions, I will be happy to answer those questions. Just send them to the Continuous Lymphoma Foundation and then Autumn will contact me and I will be happy to go ahead and uh, have those questions answered. If I don't know right away, I will promise you, I will find an answer for you. So again, let's go ahead and begin. Um, as I said, I'm an intervention specialist uh, and my work, I work with a lot of students uh, in a variety of different uh, disabilities as well as with chronic illnesses. And obviously, you know, our topic today is continuous lymphoma, but I also wanna have this, this can also be uh, viewed towards individuals with other chronic illnesses as well. So let's go and get forward here. So let's talk tonight, um, go through the process itself. The initial diagnosis, one of the most important things you want to do as a family yourself with your child is put together a medical team. And again, this is something that's the Continuous Lymphoma Foundation, all the speakers, we've had wonderful physicians over the years that have spoken to us. And they've talked about putting together that core medical team. And again, just a kind of a basic review. Your medical team could be your primary care physician, uh, your cutaneous lymphoma medical team, which could consist of your hematologist, uh, an oncologist, a variety of different specialists, uh, as well as um, a you know, your pediatrician and you know, other physicians that, you know, nurses and so forth that you would be working with over time. You want to educate yourself about this disease. This, this disease, again, is something that with the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation, they have wonderful resources. Other associations have great resources as well uh, for cutaneous lymphomas. Again, I just invite you and encourage you to be, you know, take charge of your education regarding your disease. And also parents and guardians and children, lead your team. It's not just the physicians that's leading your team. I wanna be very straightforward and make sure that you are the ones that are leading the team. So I wanna encourage you to do that. So moving forward, one of the biggest things is accurate information is so, so very important. Having, you know, you don't wanna be, you know, looking up Dr. Google as many of our physicians have always talked about saying, don't go to Dr. Google, go to the, the core resources. Again, like the Continuous Lymphoma Foundation, uh, the Lymphoma Association, uh, American Cancer Society and so forth. And we'll go over some of those other resources later on. But again, accurate information is so important. Having that good wraparound service-minded medical team, again, they're thinking and advocating for you and you wanna advocate for yourself as well, but having them you know, to you know, look at the social emotional aspect. And again, today we're gonna to talk about the academic team and why those things working together is so very important. So today, we really want to talk about, you know, geared us towards our students. And again, mom, dad, uh, guardians, 
you know, parents, you want to basically, you know, kind of take a look at this and look at it from your, your uh, son or daughter through their eyes, please. Pressures on students today, you know, without the diagnosis, there's such a higher level of mental and emotional health challenges that have been reported pre-COVID. You know, pre-COVID, we were having lots of types of challenges that our students were starting to really show and see. And so that's something that was very concerning to us even before COVID hit. When COVID hit, and again, I have a link there for the um, human, health and human services.gov, uh, COVID basically ripped the trauma bandage off when it comes down to it. Lots of things were revealed with COVID happening when a lot of our kids were basically having school online and lots of things were just you know increased more and more. So we have to really, you know, be aware of that. And I'll, most of us are pretty much familiar with what's been happening. But again, I just want to kind of do a precursor before we go forward here with this information. Our kids are seeing things like anxiety, stress, depression, and they're saying to themselves, what is this? What are these feelings I've been dealing with? And for example, in my district, uh, we went full born uh, this year. We had no uh, hybrid. We had no time where we you know, had any type of uh, online type time this year. Thankfully, we were able to you know, manage the disease and the illness enough with our, with our students. But again, you know, speaking to a lot of our professional uh, health providers and practitioners, we recognize easily the anxiety that kids were showing, our staff was showing, the depression they were showing, a lot of this is just, it's, it's ongoing and it's, it's come out and, it, and it's very difficult sometimes to deal with. So the students are saying, well, how do I deal with these feelings? You know, what do my friends think about this? You know, I, I per, perhaps, again, I have some, I'm someone with a diagnosis possibly of cutaneous lymphoma. And this is something all new to me. Um, and this is in, even increasing more my anxiety, my, my stress, my depression, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at things on my skin and I'm, I'm going back into the school and I'm thinking, what, what is this, you know, how will I deal with this? You know, what do my friends think about this? You know, they see this on my arm or on my neck or maybe on, the, on my back or something or my leg, you know, how, how, will they, how will they think about this? So it's kind of combined with all these things of kids before that was going on with COVID and then dealing with an actual diagnosis. So a lot of things would be on this child's you know, plate basically. So care plans from your medical team is so very important. Care plans, care plans. I wanna highly uh, talk about that. And then with those care plans with your medical team, your academic team, you wanna have communication consent forms from your school, your, your son or daughter's school. Those consent forms are legal documents where your son or daughter's care team can ask information from the school and they want to be able to, you know, communicate back and forth. The school may want to share some things with the uh, medical practitioners. Uh, you know, again, obviously the parents need to have the go ahead with that because of privacy and so forth and because of laws such as FERPA and HIPAA. But again, that's, that's the purpose for the communication consent forms to be signed. So again, kind of the precursor now coming into a diagnosis of cutaneous lymphoma for your son or daughter, um, you want to, you know, make sure that we start looking at some of the things that they're going through. So uh, hopefully again, that'll kind of stir some questions with you on, on that. So again, from the kid's standpoint, you know, what do my, what do my friends think about this? So look through, you know, their eyes, look through their eyes. Some of the things that they're seeing is basically a feeling of isolation. You know, there, there could be a, a school age child or a high school child or a junior high child. And they're very hypersensitive about, you know, how, you know, what's going on with them. Uh, the feelings of like, am I the only one dealing with this? You know, you, you may have a school of 700 to 1,000 people and they could be the only one with a diagnosis of cutaneous lymphoma. You know, dealing with that and dealing with all this COVID and everything and other things that are going around, um, you know, it's a lot on a child. The body image, the body image is huge. Again, you know, yes, 5% of our children, uh, if I looked at the uh, statistics correctly for the United States and Europe, uh, potentially could have a diagnosis of cutaneous lymphoma. But again, 
either way, that child is still an individual child with cutaneous lymphoma. And that body image is so, so very huge uh, as far as an impression upon that child. So that's something that you as a parent or a guardian want to be highly sensitive to and understanding and conveying that to your medical team as well and to any social emotional team that you're working with. For a teenager, again, one of the biggest things of a teenager is having that independence. You know, we're getting that independence. I'm going to break away from parents and guardians. I'm going to break away. I'm going to be my own person. And one of the things with a continuous lymphoma diagnosis or with any type of chronic illness is well, you're losing some of that independence that you were trying so hard to gain. And because of that, again, that makes, you know, that can bring on things like depression. It can bring on more anxiety because again, you're putting that from a child's eye, you're putting that control that you're so hard trying to get, you're putting it back on potentially strangers or at least to parents and guardians where you want to kind of make the break. So you have to be aware of that uh, parents and guardians as far as, you know, being aware of that loss of independence that they have. Peer relationships, again, social media, things that affect, we have to be very cautious about that, but peer relationships are so important for social emotional growth for a child, uh, whether it be school age child, whether it be junior high, um, high school child, or even pre, you know, post, post high school, again, depending on when the diagnosis comes. That of course connects to self esteem issues or, or challenges, better said. Uh, again, going back to the body image, going back to that feeling of isolation, trying to make friends, having that confidence. Again, you, you have a diagnosis of cutaneous lymphoma. How do I handle that? You know, how, how do I handle, uh, you know, talking to people uh, or, you know, if, they, if they're staring at my arm or staring at my leg or maybe my neck or my back or something that affect, you know, how do I react? So again, those are things that we have to be aware of. And again, as we talk further with this, we'll discuss uh, some of those tools and some of those uh, potential things that we can do and, and staff that we can go ahead and work with together. So again, challenges with, for students with continuous lymphoma or other chronic illnesses deal with those type of uh, challenges. For a student being in school every day, you know, when and if should you disclose your illness to, to school? Should you keep it to yourself? And again, that's a, that's a decision that you as a parent, you as a guardian, and as a child, or a young adult or a young teenager would want to make that decision first, talking with your medical team, talking with maybe if you're having any type of social emotional uh, agencies that you work with outside of school, you know, maybe you should disclose it. Maybe it's, it, you know, it's covered all the time and no one sees it. Um, that's a possibility. But, you know, possibly you might want to still consider disclosing it because again, you may have things such as attendance that you may have to go out for treatments. You may have to have doctor's visits. Um, there's a variety of different things. Maybe you um, have areas where maybe they, they've started up and it grows a little bit more on they're affecting you and you're having anything from more itching to whatever type of other symptoms that you're uh, possibly showing. Again, should you, you know, talk to your friends and disclose it? Should you talk to administration, guidance counselors and things like that, which we'll talk about later? You know, should you disclose that? So there's, there are basically lots of concerns, possibly immediately if there are physical symptoms that are visible to your peers, you have to think about that. You know, whatever your treatment requirements are as well. That's where, you know, parents, guardians, and you, you know, make that decision to have that meeting with school officials. Some other things where even if you have that meeting uh, with officials, I'm just going to give an example of high school, junior high school, for example. Students every day, um, parents, guardians, you, you want to look at it from your child's eyes. In a classroom is one thing where a staff member or a teacher, they can kind of manage the classroom and can kind of keep an eye on things and so forth. You get into situations such as what we call transition times. Uh, when a class ends, for example, for maybe first period to second period or fourth period to lunchtime or to recess if it's a school aged child, uh, going into the hallways, going into the lunchroom, going to like art class where it's a little bit more, uh, you know, more managed where the kids are more independent inside art class or physical education. Things like extracurriculars, whether, you know, a child decides to go into things like band or music or sports of any type or any type of 
uh, student activities. Those are not as controlled situations. Sometimes you run into individuals that may be maybe possibly not kind. And uh, an adult may not be nearby enough where he or she can intervene or they can intervene you know, on behalf of your child. And those are things, again, that we would want to consider building up that resilience for your child in order to see those situations. Unfortunately, they do occur, uh, parents and guardians, they do. And uh, we want to build that toolbox for the, your, your son or daughter to make sure that uh, they have that resilience built up for those type of transition times um, where just in case, you know, they, they have a challenging interaction with somebody that maybe is not very kind. Also with those transitions, you have concerns of FERPA, again, uh, and, and HIPAA. Uh, you wanna make sure that what teachers you tell, what staff members you tell, in order to just to keep the privacy aspects. Um, parents, guardians, again, I, I, bullying is something that, you know, as a, as a staff member myself, we're very, very much aware of it. And we were keen-eyed for it. And there are times though that it happens under the radar. It could happen on, uh, social media, it could happen with texting, it could happen with just a little, like I said, in the transition in the hallways, we have to make sure that that student of yours has those tools, knows where to go. And again, we'll talk about some of those resources here in a little bit where they can go and you know set those transition plans up just in case an unkind moment happens. So, but again, there's a great resource here called stopbullying.gov uh, for United States uh, Department of Education. I highly recommend reading through it. It may pertain to, you know, everyone has different situations. Everyone, there's no such thing as a cookie cutter diagnosis, obviously. Everyone has their own diagnosis. Everyone has their own challenges. We wanna make sure though, that you're just using it as a resource and it's there for you. So I wanna encourage you to do that. You may have heard the term SEL or social emotional learning. That, that is a, a stronger growth model that's going on and more of a mindset we're trying to uh, as educators and as, as uh, mental health workers, uh, trying to encourage and build those social emotional learning skills for students. You know, again, we talked about tools in that toolbox earlier. How does a student cope every day? And again, that's where we use those resources that we're going to be talking about here in just a little bit, as far as kind of building that resiliency up for that student again, which is so, so very important. Again, uh, and again, also, uh, parents, guardians, it builds up your resiliency too. And it builds up your toolbox because eventually as the caregivers, you need to be looked at too as well. So you need to, you know, to build yourself up and, and to help yourself. And then again, as you educate yourself regarding this disease, you will be even stronger and a stronger advocate for your son or daughter. And, and for those that are out there, you know, with other chronic illnesses as well. So one of the biggest things is having that plan. And I mentioned the plan earlier. Some ideas for you, maybe you're transitioning into a new school. You could talk about things such as pre-visits. Uh, maybe you could visit the school in the summertime. Visit the school maybe in the fall before you, your son or daughter goes into the school the next year. Say if you're a junior high school student, you wanna go ahead and visit in the spring. Um, if you're a school-age student going into a middle school or junior high, again, just kind of walk the school, get used to it, things like that. Maybe meet some of the administrators, meeting some of the counselors. That's just to get a familiarity uh, of, of that staff members. Sometimes schools have what's called peer ambassadors, where the student will basically, you'll have peer students that will be walking them around the school, talking to them. Maybe they could be attached to, maybe it's a new student, you're in a new school district. They could be attached to you uh, where, you know, if you have questions, you know, a peer buddy almost in, in a sense where that student's been trained, that student's sensitive, you know, have the sensitivities especially if you do any type of revealing of your diagnosis. Again, it's, it's good to have, have those peers. Um, talking about your accommodations. And again, we'll talk about these education plans that we're gonna talk about here just a little bit, you know, where you'll be using your plan, you know, and if that plan happens to not be working well, okay, great, change it. Talk to your administrator and say, hey, this plan that we put together here for my son or daughter is not working. Go ahead, empower yourself parents, guardians, you know, and your students say, hey, it's not working, you know, this plan that we put together to try to help me cope, um, change it. Talk to your doctors, for example. Maybe you have, a, you have a treatment plan that's working with your doctors. It's not working. So 
change it. Make it, you know, make it better where you're comfortable with it. Same way if any type of social, emotional agencies that you're working with outside, counseling, change it. If you don't feel good about things, change it. You're allowed to, it's okay. They wanna look at it you know, from a staff point of view. We wanna look at it from a whole school approach. It's kind of like a, a, everyone hands on deck. So if we know we have a child with chronic illness, uh, such as cutaneous lymphoma that possibly you know, needs that extra wrap around, needs those teachers and that staff members to be watching out for them or their, you know, if they have a lot of you know, absences, things like that because of treatment issues. I mean, you know, where they have to do multiple treatments. Uh, maybe they need UVB treatments. Maybe they need other treatments, PUVA, things like that, where, um, you know, for, for their lymphoma. So we want to make sure, you know, again, the communication is open and then the whole school approach that way you can communicate with teachers, the teachers can communicate with you, see if there's any missed assignments, things like that. So we don't put extra stress on that child. So again, looking at from the school aspect and the academic aspect, because we don't, as educators and as staff members, we don't want to put additional stress on a child because of their having treatments. That's one of the purposes of that communication. So that's the whole school approach. Legal supports in school for students. Again, let's talk about education plans. Two plans that might be you know, considered, but first you would work through the uh, US Department um, of Education and the, what's called the Office of Civil Rights. Those are agencies that support these plans we're gonna be talking about here in just a few moments. Uh, another agency, parents and guardians that you wanna take a look at uh, the State Department of Education, whatever state you happen to live in, you want to check that out. Check out Students with Disabilities uh, section of their website. You can call them, you know, ask questions of their consultants. Say, hey, my child has a chronic illness, has an illness that is interfering with their education process some. What are my options? What can I do? You know, what are some questions that I could ask the school district? And those are really important things. And you could write those, those questions down and be prepared. So when you talk to the administrators or to the guidance counselors or the social workers or the district, district nurses, you'll have these good questions. Again, it's educating yourself. It's, it's advocating for your, for your child. Uh, but again, you're using these resources. Again, also, I would also highly recommend that you check out your local school board of education district policies usually accessible through their website. Sometimes they have uh, information on attendance policies, uh, possibly on things such as interactions with bullying, could be possibly as well, uh, could have some information regarding medical diagnosis, FERPA, as well as HIPAA. And again, just kind of familiarizing yourself with those policies. A lot of parents and guardians may not know those policies. And it's good to familiarize yourself. Again, educating yourself that way, you know you can speak to those administrators from a feeling of, I understand what those policies are. Let's use those to help my son or daughter or my child. Okay. So here are the education plans we're talking about. 504, section 504s and what's called IEPs. It's IEPs are individual education plans. A 504, though, we'll start off with is again a, a document, a federal, a federal document through the U.S. Department of Education that basically guarantees services and accommodations for an individual that has potentially a medical diagnosis that could potentially interfere with that child's educational process. And that's something that, again, it is a legal document. It is backed by the Office of Civil Rights and U.S. Department of, of Education. And those organizations, again, usually uh, for the, a 504. And again, those are year, yearly, they're usually renewed every year. And again, with a child with continuous lymphoma, uh, that would be updated, you know, could be an individual that's absolutely, you know, they're, they're um, automatically uh, in charge of 504s. Sometimes it's the guidance department, depending on the size of the school district. Um, every, every district may have a key coordinator for that. So that's something that you would want to go ahead and be able to talk about that yeah, with that individual and then set that plan up because with a, a 504, you just need a medical diagnosis from your physician and then they would work with your physician to set up a plan that would help, say for example, if you have attendance challenges, uh, maybe some of the treatment options that your son or daughter uh, may have may make them leave school. So there's some plans that where they could set up where they won't be harmed academically in case 
they need to be away from school for a few days, or they're having difficulty with treatment options that are affecting them, or they're having uh, difficulty with anxiety, depression because of their diagnosis. We want to make sure that you know those supports are there for that for that student. An individual education plan or an IEP is more in the realm of what special education. And again, not necessarily, again, it's a medical diagnosis that is greatly, you could have, you know, that could be greatly affecting uh, them being able to obtain certain academic curriculum mandates or structures that they were, you know, a child is supposed to basically achieve uh, during that school year. And sometimes there are additional supports that they could have things such as you know, potentially attendance, but maybe they would be paired up with an intervention specialist and they would work on, say, if they're behind in their schoolwork, uh, if they're behind because of their diagnosis or medical diagnosis, uh, they would work with outside agencies, they would work with uh, teachers inside the building as well to make sure that they have goals and objectives that they meet in order to help them close any gaps that might happen because of their medical uh, challenges or medical diagnosis. So that's, again, a very general uh, idea of a 504 and an IEP. And again, I have a couple of links there as well uh, regarding both of those, and those are from the U.S. Department of Education. Again, I also encourage you to look at your, US, your State Department of Education, whatever state that you happen to reside in as well. Some of the resources now, let's talk about the resources. In a school, you have your guidance counselors. You wanna make sure that you, again, a student with cutaneous lymphoma or any type of chronic medical um, challenge, get to know your guidance counselors. Sometimes they're done by alphabetical order, depending on what your last name is. Sometimes they're by grade level, it really depends. But again, get to know your guidance counselors um, in that, you know, having communication with them. There are some of our frontline workers where they are kind of like media areas for the general education instructors. Also, district social workers are wonderful. Uh, they have lots of resources. They can work with some of the medical social workers and they can speak the same speak sometimes with if you're working for social worker, if you're a medical practitioner, they can kind of come together and work together and get services and supports potentially that are outside the school that would be beneficial for your son or daughter. Also mental health counselors with the uh, ESSER money that is out there with, from the federal government, a lot of school districts are using it more and more to obtain mental health counselors, to obtain district social workers to kind of help with those mental health challenges that students are having e anyway, even without a cutaneous lymphoma di diagnosis or a chronic illness diagnosis to, to work with other mental health and social emotional challenges that a child has. So those, those resources would be wonderful if your child you know, is facing things like anxiety, facing uh, depression, having a lot of stress because maybe they're overwhelmed because they're having to miss days and they're missing assignments and you know, your son or daughter is just really stressed out. Those are great resources to come and, and talk to them and say, hey, my son or daughter's having these difficulties. Can you kind of check in with them? And that's, that's a great thing. Your administrators, your building administrators, uh, your assistant principals, your principals, those are great people to know and, and the great people to say hello, introducing yourself, uh, parents, guardians. I, I think having that communication is so wonderful. They yearn for that communication. Believe it or not, they do. They, they want to talk to you. They want to know who you are. They want to introduce themselves. And that way they put your son or daughter, if they have 1,000 to 1,500 students in a building, you want to put your son or daughter on the radar sometimes and they want to be familiar with your name and and so forth so that way you know sometimes by showing yourself and and, and introducing yourself you know that it, it's quicker to move for that administrator at times not that they don't but it's also just kind of nice to, to say oh yes i've met you and you know we'll, we'll work with work with you teachers your son or daughter's teachers whether your school age teachers middle school teachers junior high teachers high school teachers say hello to your teachers Go to your parent-teacher conferences if you have the opportunity to, whether it be virtual, whether it be in person, you know, introduce yourselves. And again, that just kind of puts, again, you on the radar and they're watching out, you know, making sure that they're watching out for your son or daughter uh, in their classrooms. And again, school staff, all those resources are available. I never want you to forget though, the school administrative assistant or secretary, that individual is, 
they run the building. But I'll just, I'll just tell you that they run the building. Uh, no matter who that, if you get to know, you know, again, if you have to drop off things to your son or daughter, you want to get to know the administrative assistant or the sec or the high school secretary or the school secretary, because again, having that relationship with them will really be, reap a lot of benefits. I will just tell you right, right off the bat. So uh, our classified staff, such as our custodial, our bus drivers, wonderful people. They, they can start a student's day wonderfully and they can end the student's day wonderfully. So again, getting to know them as well, saying hello to them. Uh, your lunchroom staff, so many people forget the lunchroom staff. They, they can put a smile on a child's eye if they're having something such as you know, a bad day or maybe they're just, their disease is bothering them. And again, they don't have to review, re, re, you know, to reveal anything, but they just, again, getting to know all these people because all of them can contribute in a positive way to your child's daily experience. So I just wanna encourage you to say hello to them on occasion. Again, as I mentioned, establishing relationships with peers and staff, parental involvement. Encourage your student to you know, reach out if they can. If they need teachers to kind of help them and nudge them along with that, that's great. There's done a lot of different groups. Having that open communication. Staff are willing to support and you know, serve your child. You know, meet with them, as I mentioned, by phone, virtually, in person. Share your concerns. Say like, hey, my son or daughter has continuous lymphoma or they have some other type of you know, chronic illness or disease, be part of that team. Parents, guardians, please be part of that team. I, I, I encourage you to do that. Don't just stand by and say, well, they're the teachers, they're the staff. No, don't do that. Please be part of that team. I, I, I implore you to do that. Uh, educators want this, they do. You know, you know how often I've been to a parent-teacher conference and there's no parents that show up. And it's really, you know, I, and again, sometimes some things happen. Life happens. I understand that. But there's times when if you can be involved in your child's education, especially if they're working with a, a chronic disease or chronic illness, you know, be there if you can in some form or matter. Uh, encourage your, your child, as I mentioned, uh, being involved in schools, you know, being kind, you know, encourage your child to always be kind um, to, to reach out to other students, to, you know, don't be afraid to encourage them, to implore them that they are important. I had once had a staff member once years ago from my old schools, school age time, you are important and you have to have that child and make sure that they believe that they are important no matter what. More school life. So your child's had a bad day. They're, they're you know, helping them with manage with stress. Some schools have peer support groups. Uh, parents and guardians that you can take a look at, uh, being involved, encourage them involved in clubs, art club, music club, French club, Spanish club, any types of club, chess club, w whatever they can be involved in, just to kind of reach out and meet people. Again, usually there, there's almost, well, there is an adult that's always involved in those clubs, and there, you can always kind of have a little chat with that, with that adult to kind of help and encourage as well. Uh, if again, there's you know, working with some esteem challenges, uh, confidence challenges, things like that. Extracurricular, if your son or daughter wants to be involved in sports, um, art or music, again, making that connection and, and, and you know, encouraging your son or daughter to say, hey, let's do this, let's you know, get, get them going. And that will just help them with their resilience and build them up you know, tremendously. Um, again, explore your student in school opportunity handbook. You know, parents and guardians, look at that student handbook. Look at that parent handbook. Look at the opportunities for your son or daughter. Invest some time, parents and guardians, in, in your, your student's activities. And then to you students, take a look at some of your opportunities. You know, see what you can do, you know, to be involved. And, you know, there's a lot of peers out there that they would be like, hey, cool, come on, come with us, come with us, hang out with us. And, and teachers, are, they, they love to see that. And sometimes we have what's called student leaders and we encourage them to reach out. Maybe you're a little shy, it's okay. You know, we have student leaders possibly that can reach out and say, hey, come with us, come part of our group. And, and that's, you know, we try to set those up and arrange those as teachers and as staff members as well. Let's talk about three terms. I really want parents and guardians and students, very much so students, for you to be familiar with. Number one, self-management. Self-management, well, let's talk about self. We know that means me, myself, okay? Uh, or parents, guardians, this could be going towards you as well. Self-management, 
managing your opportunities, managing your academics, managing your medical team, being kind of involved, being involved with your medical team, being involved with your social emotional uh, agencies you're working with. Maybe you have an outside counselor, an outside social worker, uh, having questions for your doctor, having, you know, being, being in charge, being a leader of your team. Um, managing that. If you have a question from your doctor, emailing them or calling them or looking at um, different types of agencies, such as the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation, talking to the representatives and say, hey, I have questions. Who, 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 could I, who could I take a look, you know, and talk to in regards to that? Being in charge, you know, being in charge of that. Um, or maybe even asking someone to say, hey, can you help me? you know, uh, arrange, you know, to talk to some people to have answers for my son or daughter. That would be something for you, again, managing the disease. You know, you know again, if you're a, a school-aged child, again, that's hard. You need, you need parents and you need guardians, of course, middle school students as well, you too. But as you get into that high school range and you get closer and closer to graduation high school students, you want to make sure that you're starting to manage your pathway. This is your pathway and this is your life. You want to be able to manage those resources and agencies with time along with your parent and guardian to help you. Next term, self-advocacy. Okay, we know about self again. Advocacy. Let's talk about advocacy. That's basically speaking up for yourself, saying, hey, I don't like this treatment plan. I, I, don't, I, I don't feel good about it. I don't feel good about you know, some of these medications that I'm taking right now, it makes me feel kind of really weird. You know, I, I, is, is this normal or can I have an alternative? Um, talking to guidance counselors, say, hey, I, I don't, I, I still don't feel comfortable in the hallways. You know, I need some help with this. Can, can I have some alternatives? Maybe can I leave class two or three minutes before uh, the class changes where I can have some accommodations where I can get to class early. Uh, maybe I don't want to be in a crowd of people possibly because I'm feeling really anxious today. Uh, maybe can I go to a guidance department if I'm feeling kind of overwhelmed and I have this anxiety because of my disease, my illness. Um, can I go and just kind of sit and, you know, be, be calm for a little while? You know, can, can, can I have these things to help me if I need, if I just, I'm overwhelmed of how I feel, or I, I just don't feel comfortable and I feel kind of sick because of my treatments possibly. Can I take the test later? Can I just stop right now and then go rest someplace for a little while? Or can I just leave for the day? And I just, I feel overwhelmed and I just want my parents or my guardian to pick me up. Again, advocating for things that help you feel better and number one, feel safe as well. You know, feel safe and feel better about your experience. And again, parents, guardians, those are things that you can advocate for too. You know, whether that child has a 504 education plan, you know, for their accommodations, which you can work together as a team in the same way with the IEP or individual education plan, advocating for your child's rights because it is a right. You know, they, they, they have rights and you wanna make sure you're familiar with that and speak to those individuals, you know, and then educate yourself as well. Last word, term, self-determination. You, again, there was a teacher, that I, a colleague that I worked with for many years, and you know, he always said to make a determined effort. Uh, this colleague you know, mentioned, and I, I fondly remember this for many years, and, and the term also, you are important. Uh, both of those terms have always stuck in, in, my, in my head, uh, whether I've worked in medical social work or where I've worked as an intervention specialist. Being determined that you know what, this is my pathway that I'm setting up here. I have a goal in my life. I wanna maybe be a, maybe it's a career goal. Maybe it's a goal to get through my treatment uh, to put, you know, to, to work on my disease. Maybe it's a goal that I wanna do so well in school. I wanna, you know, excel at school. I wanna take certain types of classes. I'm determined to be successful. Or I'm determined also to be where, hey, I can reach out and get help and I don't want anybody to, you know, to block me. If I want to reach out and I feel comfortable talking to this person, well, darn it, I'm, de I'm determined to be able to you know, seek out that person and, and, and to be determined that I'm going to succeed in this and no one's going to stop me. I'm going to graduate. Again, there's lots of different things that you can have that determination. And then parents and guardians, I'm determined to make sure that my son or my daughter has the opportunity to excel despite their disease but you know, it, whether it you know, be the physical aspect 
the social emotional aspect or the mental health aspect, I'm determined I want them to succeed. And, and that's basically again, self determination, reviewing self management, self advocacy, understanding those differences between those concepts and how they're defined. So, how do I manage stress? Okay, students, uh, you want to take a look at that. Again, unfortunately, when we were under COVID for a while, a lot of us were managing stress by using these things right here. Okay, um, phones can sometimes, technology is a great thing. But you know, t staff members, and again, I'm speaking to parents and guardians as well, we are seeing a lot of that usage. And sometimes we have to be very mindful of that. We have to have the right mindset of how we use that. We want to make sure that we're, again, uh, using it in a proper way. Uh, and again, watching our social media and, and to make sure that we're, there's a lot of great apps that you could use, uh, different apps that can help you with stress. And that's a positive way to use these things uh, where it can help you with maybe you're just having a stressful day. Uh, you can practice things such as mindfulness, being, you know, staying in the moment. You know, again, that, that's, that's the, the, the core issue of mind, the core definition of mindfulness, staying in the moment. Don't think about what's going to happen seven days from now or 14 days from now, or am I going to graduate? Being, being stressed and you know, being, staying in that moment. Things such as staying, seeking out physical activity, um, meditation, having religious faith, spirituality, being out in nature, joining a group, volunteer, huge activities that you could possibly do. Um, basically, um, lots of op opportunities that you could, you could do with that. So students consider that. Outside agencies, again, medical practitioners, Gutinius Lymphoma Foundation uh, is a wonderful resource. Cancer support community, hospital organizations that you're working with, online groups, those just blossomed during COVID. Social work, uh, social workers, counseling services, all those are wonderful agencies. So caregivers, parents, guardians, you have the same type of, of services. You may need some, you know, some support as well to help with your child. So again, I invite you to look at this uh, different support groups. Um, again, medical facilities, parent-teacher organizations, be involved in your child's school. Volunteer in schools where opportunities arrive. Staff would love that. Staff would enjoy that. Thoughts for parents and info, transition to adult care. Eventually your son or daughter is gonna to transition to adult care, Practi you know, uh, practitioners. So you gotta think about these conversations to have. Talk to you, you know, talk about health insurance, transitioning from pediatricians to primary care physicians, talking about those privacy issues. And again, you can have those discussions also for your son or daughter during school time as well. Uh, your guidance counselors, your social workers could help with that as well. So those are resources that could definitely be, be helpful for that. And the privacy issues are so very important. I kind of close with this. And again, I know this is a lot of information, uh, parents, guardians in regards to this, but I, I really want to install every child, every young adult, they deserve the dream. They deserve the dream. And they deserve to be something positive in life. And I truly, truly, truly hope that you are encouraging your son or daughter to do that. And that you, you know, reach out to your school reach out to your academic teams, you know, talk to them about your child. And again, this is more of a, a general overview of what we wanted to talk about today. There's so much more we could talk about, but again, this is just more for your information to kind of spur, you know, the moment and, and spur your, you know, spur yourself as far as getting involved. And I encourage you to do that. And I encourage you students to do that. Be involved in your education. Don't worry about if you have a continuous lymphoma diagnosis. You've got lots of people who could wrap around and then support you. So seek them out. And as Jimmy Valvano says, again, there are 86,400 seconds in a day. It's up to you to decide what you do with them. And that's so, so very important. So every day is a new day. Every day is, you know, you can overcome challenges. You can push those, you know, make those toolboxes full. You can make it in high school. You can make it in elementary school, you know, junior high school, middle school, you can be something. And parents and guardians, you can be right there for them. 
supporting your child. And I just want to encourage you to do that. I know there's a lot of information we shared today. I just want to thank you know, Susan, who's just so wonderful at the Continuous Lymphoma Foundation for the work that she's done over the years. And I'm so grateful for her. I'm grateful for the board. I'm grateful for uh, Autumn. She has been so wonderful for me. Uh, been very patient with me. It's been kind of a little hectic um, uh, in the last couple of months for me, but I, I, I appreciate it. And again, I want to give a shout out to Judy Jones. A lot of times we see her on the listserv, but again, I just, I, I'm so grateful for meeting her many, many years ago, uh, even during my diagnosis. And I just want to again encourage you parents, um, be involved with your child's education, uh, be involved with educating yourself about your child's disease. And I just want to turn it over to Autumn and just thank you all so very much. Again, if you have questions, you know, put those in the box. I'll try to address those now. And then also, if you have questions after this and you see us on YouTube, you know, contact Autumn, contact the Lymphoma Foundation, and I'll be happy to find the answer. If I can't find an answer right away, I will get it for you, I promise. So, Autumn, here you go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ricky. That was some wonderful information that you shared with us today. It was so great to, to see all of the resources that are out there and available for the students, the parents, and the guardians. Um, so right now, as Ricky stated, if anyone has any questions, if you would want to go ahead and put it in the Q&A function of Zoom, I'm not really sure if people are going to have them because there were just so many things that you covered that was just so wonderful. I think one of the things that stood out to me are just all of the resources that are out there. And it's been a while since I've been in junior high or high school, and it seems like that there's just a lot more available than I ever realized as a student. I'm sure it was there before, but as a student, I just you know, I didn't pay attention. I was a snotty teenager. What am I gonna, why do I wanna talk to extra teachers? Uh, so thank you again. Uh, we don't, I don't see any questions in there right now. So I'm gonna kind of start talking through our wrap up. And if you come up with any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. If we can't answer them, uh, as Ricky stated, I will get them over to him and we will email you a response. Uh, so before we leave, Oh, we do have one question that just came through is, do we have a cheat sheet to give to teachers that explains CTCL? So actually, Sarah, I think that is something that uh, I can get for you. We do have a little, uh, some flyers on some different things. I'll, I'll circle back with you and see specifically what the diagnosis is and see if we have something uh, easy in a brochure we can give you. So um, I always wanna thank our sponsors and our individual donors. Uh, without everyone who donates, we wouldn't be able to put these programs on. And they're so helpful and we are so appreciative because without, without you all, we're not here and we're not able to share all this information. Uh, I wanna thank everyone that attended today. Uh, as always, we do have a survey that will pop up after the, we close out the Zoom and we would really appreciate you filling it out. It, it helps us know what you want to see and what we're doing well and what we can do better on. And if you haven't already done this, if you could please join our mailing list or check out our website. Don't forget about community connections and uh, follow us on so social media so that you can learn about new upcoming things. And with that, if everyone would have a wonderful evening and we hope to see you again at a future event. Thank you so much. Thank you all.